the Victory Studios in downtown Little Rock. This is Capital View. And good Sunday morning to you. Welcome into Capital View. I'm Jay Burr. Well, an interesting phenomenon with the Arkansas State Lottery in the month of December. The lottery had record instant ticket sales, but the dollar amount going to scholarships actually lower than the previous year. Here's a look at the numbers. For the year, we're up in instant tickets, which is 80% of our business. We're down in draw games. The Arkansas State Lottery sold just short of half a million dollars more worth of instant game tickets last December than it did in December of 2018. But the amount of money that went into scholarships actually down a little over $278,000. Powerball and Mega Million sales also down almost $800,000. Draw games like Powerball Mega Millions, we make more money off of them. We make probably 42, 43 cents out of the dollar on those games. So when those games fall, even though our sales may increase with instant tickets, we make less off of them. So the profitability has a variance. Scholarship money is based off of revenues and not amount of tickets sold. So each month, the lottery will deposit anything that's left over after administrative costs, vendor contracts, and prize payouts. So despite sales being up, profits actually down. You're going to have these months where we may have a record month because we sell more instant games, our profit is going to be actually less. Despite this one month downward trend from year to year, Woosley says they'll be just fine. You can't take one month and say the lottery's performing good or bad. It all evens out. Uh, so I feel pretty good about where we are at this point. The amount they projected to go into scholarships this fiscal year is actually slightly higher than last fiscal year. And there's still plenty of time to make it up. But like I said, it's only half a year in the books. We'll see how we end. October 2018's $1.5 billion jackpot run injected about $9 million into scholarships over the course of three weeks. Helped the lottery go well over their budgeted amount of $89 million that year to 98 in fiscal year 19. The articles of impeachment are officially in the hands of the Senate from the well of the U.S. Senate. Two articles of impeachment against President Trump were formally read out loud by Lead House impeachment manager Representative Adam Schiff. This is only the third impeachment trial in U.S. history. Representative Bruce Westerman reacting to the trial. I can't imagine it getting much traction in the Senate, uh, but I uh, don't know how long it'll take. You know, there can't be any other business done in the Senate while it's down there, so it just falls right in line with, the, uh, with what's been getting done in the House all along, which is basically nothing. It's uh, election year, and, and if it weren't this, I think they would be focusing on something else. Chief Justice John Roberts will preside over the Senate trial. Opening statements are expected to begin next Tuesday after the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. The yeas are 89, the nays are 10, the bill is passed. The Senate passed the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement on Thursday. It now heads to President Trump's desk for his signature. The Senate rushed to pass the trade agreement right before starting an impeachment trial against the president. The three-nation pact now only needs Canada's approval in order to take effect. The benefits of the USMCA to Arkansas include increased market access for state products, opening the Canadian market to chicken, turkey, and egg products by the natural state farmers, supporting more than 120,000 Arkansas jobs, and supporting more than $2 billion in exports from Arkansas to Canada and Mexico annually. Senator John Bozeman reacting to the new trade deal, saying in part, quote, passage of USMCA ensures Arkansas agricultural producers, manufacturers, and small businesses have a level playing field to compete in the global market. Senator Tom Cotton also releasing a statement. The USMCA doesn't just improve market access for our state's agricultural producers and small businesses. It also makes Arkansas workers more competitive with their Canadian and Mexican counterparts. President Trump and the, vice or the Chinese vice premier signed phase one of the $200 billion trade agreement at the White House Wednesday morning. It's a step toward lowering tensions in the long simmering trade war between the U.S. and China. The agreement is expected to boost exports from U.S. farmers and manufacturers. Representative French Hill reacting to the deal in Washington. Well, this is good news. Uh, I think Arkansas is a major agricultural state. China just approved poultry going back into China after the Asian flu situation. So we're having a big boost in our poultry business in Arkansas. This deal will allow manufactured goods and more uh, agricultural products into China as a phase one of a much more complicated uh, China-America trade arrangement. 
During the White House ceremony, President Trump promoted the signing as a way of delivering economic justice for American workers. Coming up after a quick break, we talk to presidential candidate Tom Steyer. You're watching Capitol View on Sunday morning. The epic sell-off is on now at Furniture Row. That means epic savings on living, dining, bedroom, and mattresses. Plus, four years no interest. Epic styles, epic selection, all with epic savings. Only at Furniture Row. If you're hurt in a car wreck, we're really going to stick it to you. We'll bury, bury, bury you in paper paper lots, of, lots paperwork. of paperwork. We want you to settle fast. So we'll pressure you. And eventually, you'll give in. Seriously injured? Call me, Justin Minton, today. Have you ever wanted a brand new camper? Hi, I'm Misty Gibson for John Gibson Auto Sales, and we are an official Gulfstream camper dealer. Whether you have good credit, bad credit, or no credit, we will finance your brand new Gulfstream camper. We also have a large selection of used campers, cars, trucks, SUVs, motorcycles, ATVs, performance trailers, and boats. Check us out online at johngibsonautosales.com and we will have your purchase ready when you get here. My problem was never really my feet. It was always my back. I had had as many epidurals that I could possibly have in one year. And that's when Tara at the Good Feet store kept telling me to try her arch supports. The future I can see now. I couldn't see it before. You can't use this. <laughs> see for yourself with a free personalized arch support fitting at the Good Feet store. Eating right and improving your health is always easier when you have a little help. For everyday tips to make sure you're living well, go to kark.com and click on the Keep on Amazing tab. Brought to you by Baptist Health. Keep on amazing. It's the epic sell-off at Denver Mattress. Save big on the Buena Vista Firm or Easy Choice Loveland. Now only $284.99. Plus, save up to 70% on model your closeouts and clearance items and four years no interest. The epic sell-off. On now at Denver Mattress. In Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. Welcome back to Capitol View. The first debate of the election year and the last one before an important Iowa caucus held Tuesday night. Only the top six Democratic candidates made it on the stage. Former Vice President Joe Biden, Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Elizabeth Warren, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Senator Amy Klobuchar, and billionaire businessman Tom Steyer, who actually joins us now. And um, I guess let's just kind of get right into things here. Uh, this has just been sort of a whirlwind tour for you here. You, you've kind of elevated your name here. Uh, I, I guess what, have you, what do you make and, and how do you sort of compare yourself to your other Democratic uh, opponents uh, so far? Well, let me say this. Jay, as you point out, I'm very different from everybody else. And I think as we get closer to the Iowa caucuses and the early primaries, I think Democrats are focused on who can beat Mr. Trump. And we know that Mr. Trump's going to run on the economy because he's saying he's running on the economy and he's saying that Democrats will ruin the economy. And in that, I am very different from everyone else on that stage. I built a business from scratch into a multi-billion dollar international business. I can take Mr. Trump on, on the economy, go toe to toe and show that he was a fake businessman and a failed businessman, and that he's been a terrible steward of the American economy for the American people. So I think that's actually a great opportunity for me because as people focus on beating him, it's going to take economic chops, and I have different experience and different expertise than anyone else on that stage. Uh, I know, kind of sticking with the economy, and I know you kind of touted yourself as the climate candidate here for the Democrats. I, I guess, how are you trying to, to bring both the things together? Because I know uh, on Tuesday night, you, you kind of said you wanted to sort of move away from fossil fuel-based economies. I, I guess kind of what are you getting at when you, when you say you want to move away from that type of economy? Well, look. Jay, I've said that climate has to be my top priority, that I'll declare a state of emergency on day one and use the emergency powers of the presidency. I've said that I'll do it from the standpoint of environmental justice, start in the communities, mostly black and brown communities, where it's unsafe to breathe the air because you'll get asthma and unsafe to drink the tap water because you'll get sick, but also that we 
can we will do this in a way that creates literally millions of good paying union jobs across this country this is the biggest job program in american history rebuild america on an accelerated basis in a sustainable way so we can deal with our climate crisis i know we can do this i know that we have the technology to do it i know that clean energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy and i know it will create literally millions of good paying jobs so I've worked on this for 12 years. I've fought and beat the oil companies about clean energy. I've pushed the utilities for 50% clean energy in the United States by 2030. So I've studied this for a long time, and I know we can do it. I know we have to do it. But we can do it in a way that makes us better paid, better employed, richer, cheaper energy, and healthier. I know obviously a big topic right now is some of the, the tensions with Iran. Uh, you, you said during the debate that you kind of uh, agreed that we were spending too much on defense and kind of sort of patrolling that area. Uh, I, I guess you, you, you also mentioned that you wanted a sort of a better strategy. What would a Tom Steyer strategy sort of look like when it comes to the Middle East? Oh my gosh. Look, we have a pretty good example, Jay, of what a strategy would look like. We would move away immediately from Mr. Trump's idea of America first, which is basically to say that we're going to have a confrontational, bilateral relationship with every country in the world, including Iran. Actually, what President Obama did with Iran is he negotiated with a coalition of our traditional allies to push Iran to give up their nuclear ambition, and it worked. So when we think about what we're trying to accomplish, we have to remember, we don't have to go it alone. In fact, going it alone is a mistake. We should be working in coalition with our traditional allies, standing up for American values around the world, and pushing for negotiated solutions that are win-win, which is exactly what we did. Mr. Trump's confrontational escalation of violence is not something that makes America safer. It makes Americans less safe, and there is no strategic way to look forward and see that it makes sense. Another one of the, the, the sort of the big things in, in the election will, will be health care. Uh, I know you were in favor of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you also wanted to sort of add a private option to that. Uh, I guess kind of explain to, to our viewers uh, what, what you sort of meant by that. Look, let's take a step back, Jay. I think everyone should recognize that affordable health care is a right of every American in the 21st century. It's a right. And the second thing is, we are paying way too much for health care. We're paying twice as much as other advanced nations for the same or worse health care. So the question is, how do we ensure that every American has a right to affordable health care and drive down the cost? And what I've said is, you'd literally put an option, a public option, into the Affordable Care Act where you could essentially join Medicare and we would use the buying power, so everyone has a right to health care. And we would then use the buying power of the federal government to push back against the drug companies in terms of cost, push back against the private hospitals, and push back against the insurance companies. That way we build on the Affordable Care Act, we leave choice to Americans, they can choose that public option or they can stay with their employment-based health care if they have it and like it. And we don't have to scrap the entire system that we've built up over the last 75 years, but we drive down prices aggressively. I guarantee I will do this. These corporations are taking advantage of American citizens. We are paying way too much. And what that means is people can't afford their health care, and health care isn't available to millions of Americans. And both those things have to change. Well, we would have, we could we could talk with you pretty much probably all day here, but uh, we know you got to go here. Uh, we do certainly appreciate the time, uh, Mr. Steyer, and hopefully we can catch up with you after the Iowa caucuses. Jay, it's great to talk to you. I really appreciate it. All right, Tom Steyer, presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. The Republican National Committee released this statement after the Democratic debate saying, quote, if they did care about hardworking Americans, they would not be touting a radical socialist agenda, agenda that threatens to undo all of the economic progress that has been made over the last three years. Their multi-trillion dollar policies stand in stark contrast to President Trump's record of results for the American people. Voters will overwhelmingly choose his winning agenda in November. We'll be right back after this. You're watching Capital View Sunday morning. I wait.
for your tax return for new furniture. FFO Home has no interest financing and the lowest prices now. Like our Lane Designer Sofa for only $4.98 or our Queen Memory Foam Mattress and Lift Base just $8.98. At FFO Home, you can take it home today. You will not get past me. And all new This Is Us, Tuesday on NBC. I feel like I'm trespassing in my own hospital. But sometimes we have to bend the rules in order to help our patients. You forged Max's signature? Enough! New Amsterdam, Tuesday on NBC. Want a free trip or two to Hawaii? Play the KARK4 Pro Football Challenge. Just go to KARK.com, click on Contests, and enter. Weekly winners get an NFL-themed fathead. The grand prize winner gets a trip to Hawaii. KARK Pro Football Challenge, brought to you by these fine sponsors. Are you looking for something new or exciting to do? Maybe a delicious twist. Oh, it sounds good. You have to join us for DJ and Heather's Bucket List. Yes, because we're going to have all the must-haves around Central Arkansas. DJ and Heather's Bucket List on KARK4 Today. I don't remember how it started. Oh. Our back and forth. Victory. Fumble. Repeat. It always came back. <laughs> You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Nice. Waiting for your tax return? At FFO Home, get real savings now. Our comfort home deep cushion reclining sofa or designer queen storage bed with dresser and mirror. Only $9.98. No interest financing, too. Enjoy real comfort today at FFO Home. You're watching Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. And welcome back into Capital View. Last week, Governor Asa Hutchinson supported bringing refugees into the state of Arkansas, but a Maryland judge has now blocked President Trump's executive order giving states and local governments the option to disallow them from settling into their communities. Here to talk about this topic with us, state representative from Springdale, Megan Godfrey, state rep from Little Rock, Frederick Love, and state senator from El Dorado, Trent Garner. Okay, guys, so this kind of has changed a little bit since uh, we had the, the big meeting there uh, last Tuesday. Um, I guess, Senator Garner, we'll start with you. I, I know you kind of had your, your concerns initially, and we'll kind of start with, with just everything, because I, I would imagine this whole thing's going to be appealed. So um, what, what did you think about giving the local municipalities and, and the states kind of that option to, to allow and disallow? Well, I appreciate President Trump's leadership on this matter. He turned it back to local control, both by the governors and the local communities who are going to be affected by refugees moving into the area. That was a good executive decision that took that kind of principles that we believe in. As conservatives, the best form of government is the smallest form of government. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, the governor made his decision. I wish there had been a little bit more input from communities. But ultimately, we had that ability for the local communities, whether that was county judge, mayor, quorum court, city council member, to have a voice in that process. And unfortunately, a Maryland judge took that decision away from us. I think it's a bad decision and I hope it gets overturned on appeal but right now we're in kind of this waiting phase see right. what happens. Uh, Representative Godfrey uh, you were in one of those districts that did right. that did allow them uh, was I guess kind of what was that process uh, did you have to kind of go out into the community what, what was sort of behind allowing refugees into in the Springdale area? Sure so in Springdale uh, we recently submitted our letter of approval both at the municipal level and then at the county level to welcome refugee resettlement and mm -hmm. I'm really proud of that as a community. I think that um, even in a politically diverse uh, district and community mm -hmm. like mine we saw that welcoming refugees is the right thing to do, that there are a lot of advantages. And so um, I think that there are questions and concerns but ultimately at the end of the day we saw um, that we do want to create a community that uh, values welcome and hospitality and inclusion and compassion and we're excited to welcome these folks. Yeah, and I know, I know too culturally uh, a lot was made of that. Uh, I know uh, Senator Stubblefield kind of really harped on, on some of those cultural things uh, whether or not you know it's a positive impact or not 
I guess, up to certain communities here. But, but uh, Representative, what did you kind of think of some of that line of questioning and, and just on how this whole process worked? Well, I, I thought, uh, first of all, I, I thought the process worked the way it should have worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, the executive order was laid out. Governor uh, Hutchinson responded to it. And then also the, the local governments responded to it. So I think the process worked uh, well. Um, I, I do think it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, Senator Stubblefield chose to, to uh, that line of the question. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because I believe that, as we all know, it's a global economy and, and different cultures are going to be impacting different places. And I think that... Um, I think that the diversity will be good for Arkansas. I think the diversity is going to be good for Springdale, and I think they're going to benefit from it. And it shows um, President Trump put out a piece, and it shows economically how the community is going to benefit from it. So I think it's a win-win. Yeah, I know he said that number was around the $16.9 billion. $16.9 billion. Yeah. Jumping yes, on that, sixteen point yeah. nine billion dollars um, uh, as a as a nation, but I'm not sure uh, specifically the number that's going to benefit Springdale and the surrounding communities. But I know that the economic impact will be felt not only in that area but throughout the state. And, and do you feel like there's a lot of confusion uh, when, it, when it comes to just the the, the fact with re refugees coming in? Because I, I know uh, Governor Hutchinson was really trying to pound that drum of let's try to dispel some of the myths that that are kind of behind some of this. Uh, you know whether or not you know, people are coming in to quote unquote be terrorists. I think one of those questions was thrown out there. It kind of seems like, but this is one of the more vetted groups of people that come into this country. The yeah, I would say it's actually the most vetted group of immigrants who are um, authorized access right. into the country. We see, you know, this is a connection between local um, organizations who are part of refugee resettlement and the American government. Right. Refugees who are granted um, access and stay here um, have gone through eight government agencies, six background checks, three in-person interviews, a very extensive um, medical exam, and all members of their family have to pass all of those um, tests at the same time. And so um, that can be a really lengthy process because it is so stringent and is so thorough. Um, and that's because really the focus in refugee resettlement is not only um, doing the right thing and, and inviting um, new Arkansans into our communities, but also balancing that with the need for safety and security of our communities. And I think that that's why this has been um, popular, why there you know, folks from, from all political backgrounds and um, stripes who say, you know what, yeah, I can get on board with this because there is that balance between ensuring that our communities are safe and that the folks who are coming in um, are ready to go to work and be a part of our communities and be our neighbors and um, are, are going to really contribute in a lot of ways. And Senator Gardner, I know you kind of had some concerns and it was more of the, the legalese, I guess, uh, of what was at least previously uh, out there before it was being struck down. And I know you were, we were talking at one point, it's, it's something with, with a hundred mile radius. Kind of, what, was, what, did you sort of, what were you trying to get out with that? Before I address this, let me address the security concern. Sure. I believe that the most refugees come in are good, honest people who are trying to do the right thing. Yeah. But Heritage Foundation found there had been 61 incidents of terrorists and refugees or the direct descendants since 2002. If you look at the San Bernardino attack, you look at the Pulse nightclub attack, you mm -hmm. look at the Boston bomber attack, that's that 1.5 generation of refugees who have come in here. You look at the recently outside the Mar-a-Lago Hotel in in Florida, mm -hmm. there was an Iranian refugee with $22,000 in a machete. So while we know that the vast majority of refugees are good, honest people, there's always that risk. I was a Green Beret, served yeah. overseas. We worked with interpreters and local nationals all the time. But about once every few months, they would come in with the IED attack or ambushes, even though we work with them every single day. So it's something we have to do. Now to legalese of it, yeah. per the law, they can not only resettle in Springdale, Washington County, they can resettle within 100 miles of that location where Canopy Northwest Arkansas is. So my interpretation of it is, is that if a, they are going to be put there and resettled, mm -hmm. that local community did have a decision before this court decision on whether they want to actively consent to that happening. I'm not saying they should and shouldn't, but I want to make sure that if you're the people I heard from over the Christmas holiday, dozens if not hundreds of people are reaching out to me and saying, we have concerns about this. What is the information right. that they had an avenue they could go down outside of the governor's executive decision. Now, I think before that judge took that off the table, that was a good checks and balances to make sure this process was done right, fair, and equitable. Now, Senator, if I could just respond to the 100-mile radius, because I did follow up after you asked that this week. Um, that was before the executive order, that the 100-mile 100 100-mile mile radius um, provision was was allowable for refugee resettlement. But now, because of the um, newly revised executive order, Resettlement does have to take place in a community that has given that 
um, affirmative authorization. I didn't read that in the executive order. I read the executive front to floor. The, it still is based on the law that was passed in the 60s, I believe, and that had the 100 mile radius. If you look at counties like uh, states like Tennessee, mm -hmm. when they're too, when they made their decision earlier, and they had that same concern. That's why you see over one third of the counties there in Tennessee writing resolutions to prevent refugees from coming there. So my argument would be until that's done in court, until we see what that actually is, that the 100 mile radius still may apply. But as we said, it's all moot now because a judge in Maryland uh, that I would have predicted would have made this decision, put an injunction on it, at least temporarily. We'll see what happens long term, uh, but I think that's a cu current status. And I think it's important to consider that you know, folks who are involved in refugee resettlement work who want to ensure that uh, these folks who are new to communities are equipped and empowered um, mm -hmm. to live their best life, to put down roots, to start building their American dream, that they want to be a part of communities where all stakeholders are wanting to welcome them. That, you know, it's never the intent or the goal of these families themselves or of those partners who are um, involved in the work of resettlement um, to put them in communities that, that aren't um, invested in um, that kind of shared and collective commitment to ensuring that they're welcome. All right, so there you go. A very complex issue, still a lot to be sort of ironed out. We'll see what the, uh, the federal uh, or the Supreme Court has to say about it. Uh, guys, we, we certainly do appreciate y'all coming on here. And, uh, you know, we'll do it again. Thanks, Jay. I really appreciate Thank it. You. All right. We're back to wrap it up after this. You're watching Capital View on Sunday morning.